I hope Tudor minded people. It's Philadelphia Carry for Tudor Time Machine. The word I share with you this week is Coney Catcher. My time travelling friends, if you transport yourselves to the London of my age, you shall find many delights. Streets full of shops and wares, pie makers, and all sorts of delicious food stuff. The river a throng with boats and colourful sails. Performers crowding the streets, juggling, playing the tambour, and walking on ropes. But you must also take care. The city is full of ruffians, cut purses, swindlers, and pony catchers of all kinds, who shall rob you before you blink. Pony catcher? How now, Tudor Files? What think you? If you're new here, I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. And we're here with Philadelphia Carey for Tudor Word of the Week. Don't miss a word and listen to the Tudor Time Machine Story Project. Jessica reads a chapter of Time's Riddle, and then my dear friends discuss the history behind the mystery. How diverting! So subscribe on YouTube and give me a like. Thank you so much for listening. And we want to thank Feedspot for naming our podcast one of the top 10 Tudor podcasts on the web. Number two, to be exact. Tudor Files are an amazing bunch. Every one of you has the wit of Rosalind and the heart of Cordelia. Philadelphia, can you give us the spelling of Coney Catcher, our word of the week? It is spelled C-O-N-E-Y-C-A-T-C-H-E-R. And this is a 16th century word for a scammer or a grifter, for a con man or a con woman. In the 16th century, they used she coney catcher and he coney catcher. Wow. And a coney was a tame rabbit, one that was raised to be eaten. So the term came from the idea that the coney was like a tame rabbit, unknowingly destined to make a meal for someone. For the catcher. A coney is like a con man's mark. Coney catcher is used a lot in theater in this period. 16th century plays are full of cousining and tricksters, and the word is used a number of times in The London Prodigal, and Shakespeare uses it in The Taming of the Shrew and in The Merry Wives of Windsor. But historians think the original use of it comes from a pamphlet from the 1590s called The Defense of Coney Catching by the pamphleteer and playwright Robert Greene. Oh, you lazy tongue gauge. The full title is The Defense of Coney Catching or a confutation of those two injurious pamphlets published by R.G. against the practitioners of many nimble-witted and mystical sciences by Cuthbert Coney Catcher, licensed Tate in Whittington College. Well, that is a satirical title, of course. Cuthbert Coney Catcher is Robert Greene himself. Lysate in Whittington College is also a fine jest. There is no such college. Dick Whittington was notorious for being a poor lad who made his fortune selling his cat to a rat-infested town. That is also an apocryphal tale. Is it so? Yes. You have been Coney caught by that legend, Philadelphia. <laughs> well, give us a passage from Robert Greene's work where he uses this word. All conditions and estates of men seek to live by their wits, and he is counted wisest that hath the deepest insight into getting of games. Everything now that is found profitable is counted honest and lawful, and men are valued by their wealth, not by their virtues. He that cannot dissemble cannot live, and men put their sons nowadays apprentices not to learn trades and occupations, but crafts and mysteries. If then wit in this age be counted a great patrimony, and subtlety an inseparable accident, to all estates. Why should you be so spiteful, Master R.G., to poor conny catchers above all the rest, since they are the simplest souls of all in shifting to live in this over-wise world? Well, he has a point. I mean, we're still asking the same question. Why does the justice system spend so many resources going after small crimes of fraud while institutional fraud is happening on such a large scale all the time and it goes unnoticed, seemingly? And Cuthbert Coney Catcher goes through all kinds of examples of fraud. Bankers and lawyers, people who lend money at huge rates of interest and get away with it. He compares them all to the little guys who end up hanging and losing their lives for insignificant and petty crimes. Should not all the criminals, large and small, hang at Tyburn? Well, that's one way to look at it. 
I guess we have a different idea about capital punishment now, Philadelphia. I mean, by Philadelphia's thinking, Robert Greene, who wrote this pamphlet, might himself have hung. He's a really interesting personality, one of the university wits of the Elizabethan period, probably now best known for his pamphlet of Greene's Groat's Worth of Wit, bought with a million of repentance, where he called William Shakespeare an upstart crow. But Greene was also supposed to have been connected to the underworld of London. I read that as well. Oh, it is so. Before he died, he wrote The Repentance of Robert Greene, a scandalous pamphlet, read by many with great attention. It tells of his sinful life, his marriage and abandonment of a rich wife, how he spent all her dowry, how he took up with his mistress M, a bored, and sister to none other than Cutting Ball himself. Cutting Ball? Indeed, a most foul and disreputable criminal of London, whom Green was said to have hired as a bodyguard when he went about the town with his band of rogues and double-dealers. And what happened to Cutting Ball? My dear friend, he was hung at Tyburn. It was the talk of the town. So that's the fate of the Coney Catcher. It is so. But it is said that Master Green himself died in his bed from an overindulgence of wine, and that he was nursed the last by his bored M. So give heed to the files, bring some 16th century sauce to your vocabulary with Coney Catcher. Listen in next time. Don't miss a word. Subscribe on YouTube and give me a like.